And we are live. Welcome, mystery and thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am so excited to welcome live from the UK, New York Times bestselling author, Sarah Pinborough, here to give us the inside scoop on her brand new Keep You Up at Night thriller, Insomnia. Sarah, welcome to Mystery and Thriller Mavens. Tell us about this book. Well, thank you for having me. And that was the best. You, you've got a, you're born for this job. That was the best excited intro to a book that I've ever had. That was so good. Um, insomnia. I'm going to be really a disappointment after that. Um, it's, <laughs> I'm very English. It's like, oh, stuff happens. No, um, it's a book about a woman. This stuff happens. Uh, not all good. Um, a woman called Emma, who is just about two weeks out of her 40th birthday. Um, and she, on the surface, has a perfect life. She's got a stay-at-home husband. She's a, a, a divorce lawyer. She's very successful. She's got mm. two little kids. Um, but... You know, she's also carrying the weight of a stay-at-home husband, two lovely kids, paying all the bills. So it, it's one of those lives that looks perfect, but actually she's really kind of, you know, having to work really hard to sustain it all. And two weeks mm. out of her 40th birthday, she stops sleeping um, and starts developing these strange nighttime tics and obsessions. And for for the rest of us, that would probably be bad enough. But for Emma... Her mother went mad on the night of her 40th birthday and had stopped sleeping for a couple of weeks before. And on the night of her birthday, she did something really, really terrible. And Emma is worried um, that this is going to happen to her because her mother always said that they were just the, just the same, you know. So she, it's kind of a descent into paranoia. Um, and as mm. her life starts to unravel... And she's had no sleep and she's exhausted and and she doesn't trust herself, but neither does she trust anyone around her. So it's it's a real kind of claustrophobic, is someone messing with me or am I going mad story. It's very cheerful. <laughs> it's very cheerful. Well, it is very tense is what it is. And oh my God, you just crank the tension up one sweat inducing trick at a time. And I can't wait to get into every tasty detail of it. Um, but first, I just want to welcome everybody who's watching with us. So we are broadcasting live to six destinations across Facebook and YouTube. So wherever you're watching from, you're in the right place. This is the right time. And this is your chance to ask this incredible New York Times bestselling author about insomnia, about her writing process, about these characters characters, how she does it, why she does it, whatever is uh, hanging out in your brain. Get those questions going in the comments. I'll get them right over to Sarah. Anissa Joy, welcome to the conversation. She says, hello, Sarah and Sarah. I can't wait to hear more about this intriguing book. So Sarah, let's start there. What gave you the idea for this woman on the brink, you know, her 40th birthday with the mother, um, the mother madness? And how did it, how did it pop in there? Well, there were a few things, really. Ooh, um, firstly, I kind of, a very tongue-in-cheek way, I wanted to play with the idea that we, we, women all have this, and not our own fault, society has made us, but 40 seems to be a big number for women, you know, like getting older and becoming more invisible because the world is designed for ageing men, not ageing women. Um, and also this, this fear we have of turning into our mothers. Which you know, like, you know, I didn't want to make it funny, but I wanted to play with that because I find it really fascinating that, you know, this woman that has raised us and and if we're lucky, if we're lucky to have had good parents, you know, um, we should adore for our entire lives. But the minute you get to about 12 years old, if anyone says you even sound like your mother, let alone look like her, it's like the worst insult in the world. And as time goes on, that gets worse and worse and worse. So I kind of wanted to play with that. But but also, I had I'd been chatting to two, to the the two um, female producers who made Behind Her Eyes, and one of them is a single mum in her fifties. Another Ooh. one is a married wife in her thirties, but she's the main breadwinner. And we were talking about um, sorry, let me turn that off. We were talking about um, female guilt, really, and how in a you know if so, my friend the the producer who's um, married she said if she misses a a school show or whatever because she's filming 
the guilt is incredible. Whereas if a man who has an equal job misses a school, a school show, it's just like, oh, that's what he does. Says man, men miss these things. It's terrible mm. what happens, you know? So we were all saying how, we, how, and I'm single with no kids and people look at you funny for that. Like it's a bit odd, how, you know, like, you, you know, 50 years old, no children, no husband, you know, that kind of thing is really, people are a bit, right? Um, so we were saying how, at, you know, women get judged so much more than men. And then mm. we just all say it, we're saying how exhausted we were. And then of course the pandemic came along and I just noticed that women stopped sleeping. Yes. Like, you know, it, it, women were doing the homeschooling, the worrying, they're trying to get the men to wear the masks that, you know, for the first few months, and this is hugely generalizing. So I know there were lots of sensible men out there, but it seemed to me that my friend's husbands took about a month or two behind the women to really get on board with the fact that this was a dangerous virus. You know, so my friends were all like, you wash your hands, do this, do that, wear a mask in the shop. And they were like, oh, it'll be okay. It's And so, so the women were carrying all the weight of the worry. Mm. Mm. And trying to sort of control the environment. And and I was I would text my or send an email to my agent in New York and she would answer it. And I'd be like, Gronya, it's three o'clock in the morning over there. What are you doing answering this email? And she'd be like, Well, I can't sleep. So I and then I just got into that and how everyone was tired and tired and hormonal. And I just thought if you put all these things into a melting pot and see what comes out the other end. And so, and then obviously I like to add a bit of weird into my stories so then there's a little bit of weird in there as well so it all kind of fermented okay Ooh, now. fermented i like the use of that word um anisa thank you for the great question um anisa is an amazing bookstagrammer does a lot of big things with friends and fiction anisa thank you for ah. the great question always a pleasure to have you sarah thank you for the scoop um to get the hashtag bts behind the scenes on how this book came to be that's fascinating mm -hmm. Catherine, welcome to the conversation. Joining us live from Seattle today. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Let My ex flatmate lives in Seattle now. He <laughs> married a man called Brian who lives in Seattle. And so now he works for Amazon and lives there. Oh, wow. So I've actually never been to Seattle. It's on my list. Um, we have a mysterious uh, fan joining us saying that they loved this book. Oh, it's Nancy Morrow Wren joining us from our my private mystery and thriller Mavens group. Nancy is an amazing bookstagrammer as well. Nancy, welcome to the conversation. Thank you so much Thank for you. Being for joining yes, us. Thank you for liking my book. <laughs> Yay. Um, Catherine saying, this is so right. What you're talking about with the stress and the women not sleeping, bearing the responsibility, the pressures bearing I mean, down. Very much, it's, like, it's like the world has said to us, oh, well, you want to have it all there, have it all and now deal with it. And actually it's like, well, men have never had to do that. Like friends of mine who are, I've got a friend called Emma who has two children and a husband who works from home. So I did use her life a little bit. And she is like... Um, She's like a director of a company that's, the, I guess, the equivalent of like Home Depot, you know, so it's a massive nationwide store. And we were away for a weekend and she rang her husband because the kids had some sports thing and she was having to tell him where the sports kit was and what they should be wearing. And I was like, surely he knows you've had these children for like <laughs> 11 years now that, must, you know, he must know. She was like, no, she goes, he'd dress them in anything. He literally would just put them in anything and send them out the door. So she was, you know, women seem to have to manage everything. Yeah. Exactly. And one thing I noticed, and I noticed this, which was hashtag relatable, um, as I was reading this book is that, um, you know, is that Emma is, you know, as you said, out there supporting her family. She's the, she's the, the sole and primary breadwinner, the only breadwinner. Uh, Robert has chosen to stay home with the kids, raise, raising their teenage daughter, Chloe, and their five-year-old, Will. Um, but he's, Sarah, uh, Emma comes home from work and, and notices that, oh, the, the carpet hasn't been, you know, vacuumed. The, the laundry basket's overflowing. The hedges need to be trimmed. Like, her female brain notices things that his male brain seems to be happily oblivious yeah. about. So she's trying to manage both. And that just cranks up the tension, not to mention facing this 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 40th birthday and we all do feel that pressure i was freaking out for probably a decade before i turned 40 <laughs> i was counting down since my 20th birthday i was like i'm halfway there you know? i remember um, someone saying to me on my 20th birthday you're halfway to 40 and i thought oh my god that seems so like old and now i'm like god i'd kill to be 40 again right but, exactly um, now i'm like fabulous 40 that sounds good um <laughs> 
We have another fan, a mysterious friend watching. We have, we're broadcasting to two private Facebook groups, Mystery and Thriller Mavens, my group, and Bitchy Bookworms. Someone's saying, I cannot wait for this group, for this book. Hooray. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Um, Catherine would like to know, did you write during the pandemic? So what effect has the pandemic had on your writing, Sarah? Let's hear about well, that. to start with, like everybody else, I think I watched all of Netflix ate a lot of chocolate and thought we were all going to die. It was that kind of like, I thought if I stepped out, I mean, I have a dog, so I had to go out twice a day. But I was like, my mom, who is, you know, we're not the closest of people, me and my mother, but she lives, thankfully my sister lives with her. They live like half a mile away. And I would walk past and see them through the window and I'd be texting my sister saying, do not let her leave the house. She's 80 years old. And, you know, like, so at first I was really stressed because I, I grew up with like Stephen King's The Stand and, so I was really in that sort of virus mindset. Um, but then after a little while, I mean, I was in it, I was in the lucky position as I had, so I had this book to write, but I was also planning to write the TV version alongside the book version. So I started with episode oh. one. So I was working with Left Bank who made Behind Her Eyes. So we were doing episode one. So that got me back in the zone. And then, I mean, it was a completely different, the, the core principle was the same, but the characters were quite different and everything. And then it, it got to the point where I just thought, no, I've got to write the book first because otherwise the book's never going to get written because TV is such a slow process. So I stopped that, but it, it had fired me up to start the book. So then I wrote the book, but I also had, uh, yeah, I mean, I wrote, I wrote another TV pilot for another company. I was in a writer's room for a while on Zoom. So that was nice because it, you know, kept you kind of sane and, and talking to other people. So, yeah, I worked quite a lot, actually. I mean, but I am a hermit by choice. You know, If I have more than one or two things in my diary for the week, I get a bit stressed out. And now that everything's opened up again and it's like going into London twice a week. And I keep sort of saying, I'm going, you know, I leave my dog with the dog sitter for the day. And I say, I'm off into London to get my COVID. I'll be back this <laughs> afternoon. And then I'm like, did I get any COVID? No, I'm okay. So, so you know, it's a weird because it's kind of like the pandemic's over, but the pandemic's not over. So it's this weird sort of hybrid life. But yes, I did. And um, I, 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 once I got started with it, it, it was, it was fine to write. I think once I got past that initial couple of months where I just watched sitcoms and stuff on and movies I watched a lot of old 1940s film noirs Ooh. I really I re watched like all the old like witness for the prosecution and double indemnity and all these kind of yeah. rear movies. window yeah yeah I love all these old films so I mm. I just went on a bit of a, a jag of watching old films and then I realized that I probably should write a book because <laughs> I was also when you're in the lucky position you know, I had friends who who were made, They a couple of friends of mine had become self-employed just before the pandemic. So they got no furlough. So they got, you know, they had no money coming in. The government wouldn't give them any money because they weren't in a job. And it, so I thought, well, at least I'm lucky. You know, I'm, you know, I had money coming in. So I thought it was, um, I should earn it really. If you're in the position to be able to earn money without having to go out and work in a supermarket and get COVID, then it was, I was being silly to not do it. Yeah. It, it, yeah, I have it, it, it exactly. And it's a struggle with feeling like you should, but then also having trouble concentrating when you're worried mm. that we're all going to die. And there's my a lot reading of went out the window. Reading oh, yeah. totally died for me for ages. And I've started yeah. to get back into that now, but it, I couldn't read. I could watch TV, but I couldn't read. Same. Uh, my concentration mm -hmm. shrank to uh, the size of a gnat. I couldn't read for a long time. I, all I could do was just sit and worry and fret and watch. And wash my hands. And wash my hands <laughs> and watch TV. Yeah. Um, Sarah, you said that you, so you, you took all of these sort of um, simmering tensions that we were all witnessing in the world. And then you quote, added a little weird to it and let it ferment. And Nisa is saying, we all need a little weird in our <laughs> lives that you like weird. What is it that that you like about weird what what, yeah. what fascinates you I mean I I think when I was a kid from a very young age like I remember someone gave me Peter Pan as a kid like when I was like five or six and I loved it I loved the idea of things that are just out of sight and I started off writing horror novels my first six books were horror novels and then I wrote historical <laughs> crime horror then I wrote fantasy and then I've written fairy tales so I've traditionally come from a background of very very weird you know 
So then with Behind Her Eyes was my first sort of mainstream thriller. And even that, I thought I want to put something odd into that. So I just I just like to put something strange into something very, very normal. You know, so you've got a very, very normal situation and then just something a little bit paranormal, I guess, rather than Ooh. supernatural, I would say paranormal. Yeah. Oh, fascinating, fascinating. Um, we have a friend joining us from Texas. Oh, hello, Christine uh, Mott. Welcome. She says she is watch. She is watching us live from Texas, um, and that she we women are used to multitasking. Amen. Right? We <laughs> we if we're not doing five things at once, we might as well be doing nothing. But it would uh, be good if the men got a bit better at it and and took three of those five or two of those five things and actually just had them done without needing a list. You know? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And Catherine, who's watching from Seattle, sharing that she's English as well. She's from England. Oh, perfect. Yeah. The perfect blend of British and Seattle. Um, that sounds that sounds fabulous. Thanks so much for watching with us. Leela, welcome to the conversation. She's saying, Thank I just you, Leela. this book. <laughs> Yay. Thanks, Leela. Um, uh, let us know what you think about it, what page you're up to, what you're thinking, where you think this is going. Um, Catherine is saying insomnia is a big, bad, a big, bad word for me. And it was a hill I had to get over. So I also lifelong sufferer of sleeplessness and insomnia here, Sarah, I, I noticed in your dedication that you dedicated this book to a fellow, a sleepless friend, um, for Jessica, producer, dream maker, friend, and fellow sufferer of sleeplessness. Yeah. I loved that. I thought, what a lovely dedication. You know, so sometimes it it's nice to remember that other people don't sleep very well too, because yeah. when you're awake in the night, on your, you kind of feel like you're totally on your own and the world is asleep. Yes. But actually, all the night owls are still up, even if they're not insomniacs. Like uh, my friend, Callie Taylor, she writes as, as CL Taylor. And we we did an event together a couple of weeks ago, and she goes to bed at four in the morning. When I get up at half past four in the morning, so Wait, I was like, which, oh. which author is this, Sarah? Uh, C. L. Taylor. C. L. Taylor. Okay, so yeah. when I, I'm also a night owl. Oh, um, are you? You so see, I'm an early bird. I like to be up with the lark, but then often I'm still awake at like half twelve, one o'clock. But then I wake up at half past four. But I go to bed like 10 with a book, like I will go to sleep. And then like I'm there still reading, doing a bit of Duolingo, <laughs> you know. <laughs> like, what language are you learning in Duolingo? French. French. Okay. So I picked up Duolingo in the pandemic as well. I'm learning Italian. So high five for the du Duolingo. I'm Anyone else? I'm on day 190 without a break. And how's it? Go wow. Oh, my God. Congratulations. How's it yeah. going? Are you feeling fluent in French? Yet? Well, I, use, I did a level French. Oh, uh, that's cool. So that's like college entry level yeah. French. But that was a long time ago. So a lot of it is coming back. I, I wanted to do Spanish, but I thought French is the one I'm probably best at in my, you know, my memory's got more French locked away in it. So yeah, it's coming, right. you know. It's definitely, I feel like I could go to France and I might not be able to speak it very well, but I would understand quite a lot. You know? Well, they would, they would, they would appreciate the effort. I think. Um, no, the French hate it. The French is, yeah, unless you can do it perfectly, they look at you with disdain, and I respect that because the English really need to get a bit of disdain from other language speakers because we're so rubbish. Uh, oh, you know, like we just expect everyone to speak English. It's like, oh yeah, you know. Yeah. But the rest well, of Europe is like, really, make more of an effort. <laughs> I. I tried to learn French uh, at uni in college, but I, I struggle with the RL sound, like the je ne parle pour français. It's a hard <laughs> sound to make is the RL. So yeah. I turned to Italian with Duolingo, and I'm hoping it's just innately in my DNA that it will come out somehow. You look like you should speak it fluently, so it'll be yes. like... I feel you like can, like you can probably do face expressions and just like... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Anissa is saying, since you like to add a little weird to your books, does this make you step away at times because it has gotten too weird or is there a too weird or is there never too weird? Let's lean in on the weird, Sarah. Well, I think it depends what you're writing. So okay. if I'm like on a practical level, if I'm writing a psychological thriller with some weird in, it has to be a psychological thriller first and foremost. So the weird will be central. But the clues have to play out like a thriller and the characters have to behave like a thriller. If I want to go too weird, I'd write it as a horror story or a ghost story or, a, you know, and so then the, everything is leaning into the weird. Whereas in, a, so with Behind Her Eyes, 
all the clues are there from page from page one, but it reads very much like a thriller until you realize there's something weird going on. And the same with this one. It reads very much like a straightforward thriller. This one's a little bit more creepy. Mm. Um, but yeah, so there's no such thing as too weird, but you then have to redefine the genre you're working in. Oh, you know, because your mark because your publisher will. You know, before so before I wrote Insomnia, I handed in so after Dead to Her, I handed in, I think, 11 outlines to my editor. And she was like, this one's not psychological thriller enough. This one's weird. This one's a horror. This one's not a thriller. This one is a crime story. This, so, you know, obviously, once they start putting you in a in an alleyway, they want you to stay in your alleyway. So, yeah, so my alleyway is psychological thrillers with a bit of weird. So I have to keep it within this framework. Hmm. Ah, okay. Now, it's okay. Anyway. It's interesting that your your lane, as as we say over here, is psychological thrillers with some weird. That's a that, that's a very unique. It's a very uh, specific Kimber lane. I think there's maybe me and CJ Tudor. There's like the two of us are in our kind of weird lane. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, fascinating, mm-hmm. fascinating. Um, so I am also a huge fan of 1940s noir and actually all 1940s movies. I'm a huge, huge old movie buff. Cary Grant was my first crush. Um, I love him. And so, so many people are chiming in. Um, L- uh, Leela saying that she loves old movies. Catherine saying she loves old movies. So many people also loving old movies with us. So we are in the right place. Heather Gudenkoff, New York Times bestselling author of eight books, most recently, uh, The Overnight Guest. Welcome to the co- has entered the chat. Welcome now to the I've conversation. Got stage, right? <laughs> Yay, got hi, stage, Heather. Right? Hi, Heather. So great to see you. She says Team Hitchcock all the way. Um, Heather, so great to see you here. Thanks for joining us. Um, Dana Belden, welcome to the conversation. Thanks so much. Leela saying she loves all of your books sarah uh leela let us know if you have a favorite in i the- think she was probably speaking to the new york times best-selling author a second ago i think she's she that, i think that's her comment for her <laughs> you're being quite modest and lovely and i bet i bet leela loves both of you because you're both amazing amazing um uh, writers um Catherine is saying there is no such thing as too weird. <laughs> some other yeah, she's obviously not met some of my ex-boyfriends because you know <laughs> there was a little, there, some of them were a little too weird. <laughs> and that's why they're that's why they're your ex. Yeah, that's why they're exes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, Sarah, this book is racking up so much incredible praise. Lisa Jewell raving. If you loved behind her eyes, prepare to be totally and utterly blown. Way by insomnia. Sarah Pinborough is a twisted genius. So um, let's talk about your twisted genius, Sarah. <laughs> so let us let us know. So how does your twisted genius write her books? Do you outline everything? Um, you said you handed in eleven outlines to your editor, then they yeah. you picked one well, together. Pitches, pitches, you know. Um, I do outline because I think because I work on lots of different. I have to have the ending. I have to see the ending has to be locked in, so I have so to you, see the entire ending before I start. So you so, see the ending of. So you have the idea and you know the ending of of the book. Then you fill it in, or how exactly does it work? Well, so I have the ending, and I'll have like. That so the ending, the final chapter of Behind Rise was in the pitch for the book. Yeah, that was so you know I have have it have to have it. To, I can't start writing unless I have the ending totally locked. Does the ending um, ever change though? Like based on no, as you write? No. Wow. Okay. Everything else changes in the plan. You know, like but the ending never changes. I work towards that ending, and every things can change along the way. But that the end because then I. I I just wouldn't be able to start writing if I didn't think it was the right ending. And so that, you know, it's, and it's always with that really, yeah, that works kind of feeling. I mean, it might not work, but in my head, it it works at the time. Um, And so then I kind of, I try and plan, I'll have a notebook and I'll have kind of rough ideas for the characters and then I'll try and put some temp pegs in. So like end of act one, this kind of should be at this point, big reveal here, twist there. You know, so I know that there's going to be some kind of what I'm working towards. I'll put the key moments in and then work towards them. And obviously, as you go, better ideas come along and you change things and people's characters change and stuff. But the the ending never changes. Um, So I try and kind of plan 
10,000 words at a time, really, around those 10 pegs. And so then I'll write the 10,000 words and I'll plan the next 10,000 words and I'll write those 10,000 words, plan the next. Um, but because I work on lots of different things, so at the moment I'm working on uh, one film, three TV projects, and obviously got to start the new book. So there's a lot of stuff going round and round and round. So it's, I, I couldn't do it without planning. So I'd like to have something planned before I leave it. So if I've got to do a redraft on a script, I will make sure I've got 5,000 words planned out so that when I come back to it, I'm like, oh, yeah, here's where I was. And it's the hard work is done. So then you get into the zone of it again. But um, I'm a lot slower than I used to be because I work on, on more things than I used to. Wow. Catherine's saying, wow, that's so much you're working on. Because I uh, don't have a life. <laughs> <laughs> but but not going to work. But to, to Lisa Jewell's praise, you are an evil, evil genius um, because the because every single thing is so on point and so and the tension you just cut is cu you come in at a twelve and you take it right up to a fifteen. <laughs> I mean, you're just at a constant simmer and 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 and, and, and sort of the characters are ready to boil over. You've got the the kid issue, then you're worried about you're worried about the you know Emma's worried about her fortieth birthday and things are she's trying to get a promotion at work and and then someone's keying her car and it's just and then she's got her sister who's popped back up you know and just there's so and just when you think like oh my god you, you know if you're if you're not if you're not already uh sleepless this book will keep you up at night um so i love how you sort of keep adding you know one little oh, okay. thing as an in ian rankin raving creepy as all get out a master uh, a gaslighting master class so let's talk about let's talk about about gaslighting again um, so many of these 1940s noir are mm. sort of about gaslighting so how do you go about um, cr creating that gaslighting feeling without making us feel that we can't trust what's going on. How do you do that? Well, I think in this book, it was probably easier than in some other books Ooh, because, okay. because Emma's not sleeping. And because, I mean, when I was researching insomnia, because obviously I don't sleep, but I'm not like someone who's hospitalized with it or anything, you know, but you know, after the, if you go without any sleep at all for three or four days, you will be hallucinating. You know, you, that you are literally starting to get dementia from that point on. So she's, I mean, she's obviously getting like an hour here and an hour there, but she's not sleeping a lot. So she's really starting to lose her marbles. Yeah. And I think that makes it a lot easier because she's seeing everything around her through this prism of A, her own fear about inherited madness, plus her not sleeping, you know, so so it's 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 like taking the unreliable narrator to the next level because she mm. doesn't trust herself. So she doesn't trust herself. So we don't know what to trust either because she doesn't know if it's in her head or is it somebody else or is she doing this herself? And then you know, like her kid starts doing these really creepy drawings, and yeah, it's all like, is this me? Is this him? What's going on? Why is he's why is my child scared of me? And so that you know. It's she's almost gaslighting herself to a certain extent because she, she just can't figure out what's going on because she's not she's but not Ro in a good enough position to. But then Robert is also cranking that up by saying, "Well, you keep waking him up by going into checking on yeah. him." Yeah. So then of I mean, course, Robert, the husband. I mean, I've, I've I've much maligned men in this conversation so far, <laughs> but I think part I, I was also quite interested in, you know, these kind of stay-at-home husbands and how they feel about the world I think at one point I literally lifted a, something that Jess is Jess who I dedicated the book to the producer her husband said to her I don't know if, if I put it in the book but I've put it in episode one of the the screenplay and he said something to her like I just feel like nothing I say is valued like Ooh. nothing I say has any weight because the decisions are made by you and oh, I thought it was such, when she told me I said it's so weird because that's such a stereotypically female role and, mm. and it, could be, it could have been said by any if someone gave you that line and said did the man or the wife say this you would think the wife said it right I, I think there's something really interesting in men who've been quite brave to stay at home and have that kind of male thing of they're supposed to be the breadwinner and then yeah. stay at home but then that gets boring for them too so Robert is in this stage of he's not really sure he wants to stay at home anymore so it's I think the dynamic is quite interesting 
between the dynamic them. is so interesting. And actually, last week I just hosted Sally Hepworth, the incredible oh. Australian author of uh, most recently The Younger Wife, and her husband is a stay-at-home husband um, and father. So it's so interesting to start to explore these oh. and see these roles more often. Courtney Smirachinsky, thank you so much for joining the conversation. Courtney's an amazing bookstagrammer. I'm going to drop her link right here. She is Caffeine Read Repeat. She would like to know, Sarah, what has been your favorite? She's joining us live from Canada. Um, she nice. says, Sarah, what has been your favorite book to write out of all of the books you've written? I'm such a huge fan. I love all the books you've written. I can't wait to read this twisted chocolate mind press. <laughs> I want that at the front of the book. Courtney, she writes the funniest, most adorable book uh, reviews ever. So I'm dropping her link in here. Everybody, she she's so funny. That so check so it out. Cool. Um, so um, I don't know what is the best one because mm. this is book number 28. My God, no, woman, you're the amazing. One, the first one came out December 2004. So it's a lot of books. Um, but I think... Oh God, it just changes. You know, there's a few that I'm fond of. I really like my fairy tale trilogy, Poison, Charm and Beauty. And I really like the Dog Face Gods trilogy. I think when they're trilogies, I like them because, I mean, I don't like writing them because they go on forever. But when I look back on them, I spent a lot of time in those worlds. So I, you know, they seem like more of a lasting impression than some of the others. Um, I think I probably like them all now that I'm getting older. I think even the early horror novels that I'm a bit like ashamed of because the grammar and stuff was terrible. Um, but I still think, you know, they were they were they were early books, so I was quite proud of them. But um, yeah, I think a lot mm. of people say the Death House is maybe mm. my best book, but I don't know. I don't know. I like the fairy tales; they were fun. Wow, number 28, all hail the queen. My <laughs> the God, woman, teach me your ways. Catherine's saying, speaking for all of us, saying, what? I know, it's like people always say to me, oh, I read your first book. And I think they mean behind her eyes. And that was my 23rd <laughs> book. <laughs> wow. So it's what good, is you know, because I think we live in this era of the debut is king. You know, like you so often see these enormous debut books, like, like a first time writer who gets some enormous deal and the book comes out you know, and it dealt, does really well. And it, I think it makes people think that if they haven't had a smash hit with their first book, that they're destined for failure. And that isn't the case. It's a long road and it goes like this. And you see some people get a big hit and then there's nothing for years. Other people just steadily trot along making a living. You know, so it's, I, 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 so I have no kind of um, expectations of the business. You know, I understand what it's like to be earning low and I understand what it's like to be earning high. And I know that the truth sits somewhere in the middle, you know. Oh my gosh, you're getting so many hearts up on Facebook for that. So this is clearly resonating. Um, thank you for thank you for sharing that. Um, and 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 it's so true. You know, I'm so tired of these thirty under thirty, forty under forty, twenty under twenty. Yeah, yeah. Let's celebrate people who are who have who are doing things when whenever they're doing them and have taken the time to marinate and to and to and to curate and to and to grow in a meaningful way. Um, I. I I think it's like we we we're, we all suffer a little bit from social media like you know like but when I started out writing there literally was we, there was no Facebook there was no Twitter there was if you were lucky there was a chat room somewhere you know so you had to go to events and you had to do other stuff but you also just sat at home and got on with it you know whereas now I think it's very easy and whatever level you're at I bet even Stephen King sometimes looks at some praise for somebody else's book on Twitter and thinks oh my god you know, am I ever going to hit that height again? Or, you know, like everyone has it. Don't we? we see everybody else's yes. good stuff and we spend all our time thinking, oh my God, what if my book fails? And actually, this part of why I like living in a small market town where I, literally no one in my town is an author. All my friends are, have got jobs and all kinds of different things. And I know loads of people from dog walking in the park and it's healthy. I, if, if, if a book doesn't sell, if I had to, if I lost my book deals tomorrow, Hopefully not. But, you know, if that happened, they would still be my friends. There would be no, I, you know, you don't see plumbers hanging out entirely with other plumbers. And I don't think plumbers have writer's egos. So I think there's that you've got to balance it and do not take social media very seriously and step away, like step away from it because people are not posting their entire lives. They're not posting their entire careers either because there are plenty of lows that people don't post. You know, exactly. yes. everyone posts the highs. Very few people say, oh, God, 
you know, like my book sales are shit this week. Or you know, like, no right. one posts that stuff. They post, oh my god, look at my show on Netflix. And right. who, who really cares about your show on Netflix apart from you? You know, so there is. Well, I mean, I think like, we all care about your show on Netflix. Yeah, but you know, like, all it's, it's it. sometimes you think, you know, like I mean, I was terrible for getting over excited, and we were in lockdown. But I think next time, she says, hopefully, I'll be a bit more circumspect and maybe post some bad stuff because. It's too easy for for new writers to either buy into the hype mm. of social media, which is a waste of time and doesn't sell any books, mm. really. You know, like those mm. days are done if ever they were here. Um, and just get on with writing and doing stuff you enjoy and don't get suckered into believing everybody else's hype. Mm. Listen to your grandmother. You know, like. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um Jilly McMillan, who was on the show a few weeks ago, raving Sarah Pinmero is the master of the unexpected. And insomnia does not disappoint. This terrifying thriller about a family under threat from within is a total page turner. So Sarah, as both a horror writer and 28 books in, what have you learned about the craft of creating fear? Oh, I don't Because it's know. hard to write fear, isn't it? It's hard not to be yeah. cheesy. I think peop- there are two things that... Ooh, tell and me. And again, I'm not a great believer in giving advice because everyone has their own way of doing things. But for me, I have read a couple of supernatural thrillers that have been written by very good crime writers who decided to have a go at a supernatural thriller. And they put the supernatural in way too fast, way too early. Because I think you want to sink people into the world. You can have a shadow. You can have a little glitch as I feel a bit nervous about something. But if you go too hard, too quickly, you haven't set the scene. You know, like, the you know, horror writers. When I look at crime writers and horror writers, crime writers are much more sparse with their language choices because a lot of it is about pace. Thriller writers, anyway. It's a lot about pace. So shorter sentences, straight to the point, punchy, punchy, punchy. Horror writers slower more descriptive more scene setting so you know like it's really they use a whole different language sets so i think if you Mm. if you want to infuse some creepiness into a thriller you kind of still need to keep that sparse pace because thriller readers want chapter 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 but when you start seeding the weird just a little drop here, a little drop there and let it build. Like, you know, that that Chinese water torture where it's first one drop doesn't matter. But when you're getting that same drop in the same place for hours, that's really going to start having an effect. So I always think less is more, I guess, would be my my takeaway from that. So there's a book called, which I would suggest anybody who's interested in writing anything creepy mm. should read, called um, Dark Matter by Michelle Paver. Ooh. And it's not a very long book. And it's set in like um, like an Antarctic or Arctic station. Mm. I think it's like 1910 sort of time. Mm-hmm. And it's just really creepy, but it never goes over the top. It never, but it really scares you. So it's mm. really gentle building of the creepiness. And I think we are not scared by the monster. We're scared by the threat of the monster. So we're, not, we're not scared of like if the monster comes out from the bed yes okay we now know there's a monster but we've seen it when you just see a shadow move under the bed that's much scarier than knowing what the shadow is under the bed or if the cupboard door creaks open a gap and there's just that black space that's a lot more creepy than the cupboard door swinging open and there's a monster in there you know Ooh, fascinating fascinating that's just my take on it is less is more I love that. I love that. Less is truly more. Um, this is so fascinating because when you think about, um, you know, how you when you're sitting here reading a book, I'm not. I'm not in Emma's scary house. I'm not in Emma's scary life. I'm safely here in Boston. You know, in my what's not good with my puppy, and yet I am scared. Yeah. So it's a fascinating thing to think about creating fear you know, mm. through, through these pages. Um, 
yeah. So thank you for thank you for these fabulous thoughts. Um, welcome to the conversation, Margaret Pinard, joining us live from Portland, Oregon. Um, so great to have you here. She's saying, "Oof, what a question, Sarah. I wonder if any crime writers have borrowed from political <laughs> campaigns for how to leverage fear in the writing." That's a good point. Wow, oh, I think what oh, was that? Yeah, like, Oh, chocolate mind pretzel quote. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think, I think, what was that Stephen King novel about the guy who was trying to assassinate the president who was going to set off a nuclear war or something? Yes, so yes. I think it's very difficult because I think even in this world, yeah, such divisive politics, mm. I think you're kind of sworn off putting too much into your books because mm. no editor is going to let it run. If you like, if you're slagging off or being horrible <laughs> about one whole side of the political spectrum, all your publisher is seeing is like, well, those people aren't going to buy the book now. So, you know, and I think it's, I, I don't know. I think if you're writing a political thriller, different, but in a, in a sort of psychological thriller, I think politics is so depressing. I don't think I'd want to spend any time writing anything political totally um courtney is saying that she gives you full permission to use the chocolate mind pretzel quote you can <laughs> have them all sarah you can have them all um we have a mystery fan saying oh my god this is so exciting this is so exciting we're so happy to have you here queen pinbarrow thank you <laughs> for joining um in and Catherine saying that dark matter is such a great book it is literally chilling um thank you for thank you for chiming in on that Catherine. so great to know that it resonated um and and uh, just making sure i'm not missing anybody's thing i want to remind you all the book is out now and it is time to order it because you guys this book is so good and you are going to want to get in the mind of this of this of this creepy genius as lisa <laughs> Joel said so um grab it and support um our favorite woman-owned independent bookstore right here i'm popping the link into the comments um we have two minutes left with our time with sarah so anybody i can probably take one or more one or two quick less questions to get them going in in the comments meanwhile here is the link to the book you're gonna want to be kept up all night by insomnia so grab I love it the cover, you know that american cover i really love it you do love I it do okay love it. do you do you have a favorite i have to go look up the british cover now do you yeah, have a hang on. I've got a oh, british let's one. hold it up Ooh. So it's got like broken glass on the front do you have, is this, so the American copy is your favorite then, Sarah? Well, yeah. I mean, normally I like the English one better. And then you argue with the Americans for about three weeks <laughs> to get the cover you want because we have such different cover sensibilities. The American covers and English covers are always so different. Um, but this one, when they showed us that one, it was the fastest yes ever. Like all of us went, yep, we really like that. I mean, I do really like the English one too, but I think I the American one has the edge for me. I think it's a bit sexier. It's a bit creepier. Yeah. Because you yeah. kind of see, you kind of see that you see her her pacing the halls there. Yeah. Uh oh, Leela saying she likes the British cover. Oh, I love it too. I really love the British cover too. But I really, you know, they're both they're both really good. But I find the American one is just. I think it pops a little bit more. You know? I think it pops. I also I love I also love how you can't really I love her hair her going across her face. Yeah. I and that. I like how this um this M and O you can sort of as soon as you see those wavy lines, you can sort of hear in your mind that zzz, zzz, yeah, you know, sort yeah. of old TV scratchy yeah. going. Um so when I filmed my book talk yesterday, my TikTok book talk, um, I used a filter on it to create that same, they call it the 70s filter to create that same oh, okay. um, disruption. Um, Margaret Pennard saying it is so good, and she thinks she saw someone still up at 1 a.m. reading it. <laughs> Guilty, it was me. <laughs> um, Anisa saying she usually likes the UK cover best, but she agrees that the US one is better this time. Um, oh my gosh. Well, thank you all for all of the wonderful comments. Thank you for all of the hearts up on Facebook. Y'all, the book is out now. I'm gonna post the link one more time. Grab it now. And then, oh, thank you for all the hearts, you guys. Um, grab yeah, man, thank, thank you, everybody who who listened in. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Thank you so much for everyone who 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 listened in. Catherine saying the contrasting blue and orange on the US cover really catches the eye better. 
Um, I feel like I should be reading that with a British accent. It really catches the eye quite better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it does, doesn't it? And orange is also one of my favorite colors. Um, Catherine, thank you so much for the comment and for joining us live from Seattle. Y'all, the book is out now. Grab your copy and then hop over to the Mystery and Thriller Mavens Facebook group where all the good tea is spilled, as the cool kids say. So we continue the conversation about all things mystery and thrillers over there. So I'm going to post the link in the comments. So join us. Us. It's free and open to all. And we just chat about all the books we love. So um, come on over and join us. Sarah Pinbro, thank you so much for joining us here today, live from the UK. And y'all, I'll be Very back. Much. Yay! And I'll be back tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern with Samantha Bailey here to give us the inside scoop on Watch Out for Her. See you soon for, uh, for that. And in the meantime, have a great Monday for Hashtag Mystery Monday, because you know Mondays can be murder. <laughs>